Welcome to our crypto economics crash course. This is part three, new frontiers for crypto economics. I'm Luciano Pesci, PhD, founder and CEO of Imperitas. I also teach economics and data science at multiple higher ed universities. If you do not feel like you have a good sense of what crypto is at its most basic component, go back and watch part one. If you feel like you understand both the technical and social components of crypto, then jump ahead to part two. Tokenomics isn't crypto economics where the governance, the market, the people are all explained in detail and, and the process of tokenomics, which was the first attempt to apply economic theory to crypto is explained. But today we're going to get into what's the next frontier. So at this moment, what's the forward looking stuff that's being used? One of the fundamental ways that crypto economics differs from tokenomics, which was explained in part two is that it uses a lot of real data from things other than the blockchain itself. Too many cryptos are being built on these untested, underdeveloped ideas using these macro outcome variables, and they don't understand what's going on underneath. Just because you're passionate doesn't mean that you are the entire market. There's lots of other people who are involved. You have to go speak to them. And I mentioned in part two that there was the Silicon Valley tried and true method of figuring out that product market fit. If you go down to the bottom left here, you can see a link that will take you to a source on this lean customer discovery research authored by someone who is a pioneer in Silicon Valley startups using this very idea. Keep talking to customers as you develop and talk to people often. Update between having conversations with them, see what is going on. This will help you find your fit in that bigger market. When you do that, you will experience your J-curve growth. Now, both tokenomics and crypto economics bring in market intelligence. I think the approach is what differs. A lot of the market intelligence in crypto economics might just be the macro outcomes, total market share, something that's in a ratio with total uh, market cap, for example. That's not necessarily the best way to go. There's a lot of information about the market that you might want to be watching all the time. Crypto is only a little part of the bigger overall market which means that you have to be watching those global trends, not just your domestic trends. And these can change in an instant. That's one of the lessons of economic history. And your forecasts, your macro forecasts, should account for as much of this as possible. What kind of shocks should you be worrying about regulatory-wise, competitor-wise, market-wise? What about the overall economy? If the overall economy just slumps, then of course crypto as part of it is going to slump. How are you going to react to that? You need market level intelligence to answer that question. Now, a subsection of market intelligence focuses on your specific vertical, your specific competitors. And it doesn't matter who you are, you have competitors. If you don't believe you have competitors, then you're not being honest with yourself. You just haven't actually looked at your market and you don't actually understand your customers because they looked at some other options before considering you other tokens, other cryptos, and you compete with them. Could be that you have a green theme like Bitcoin origin. Okay. Every other token that has a green theme might be a competitor. Every other token that has a similar kind of validation system might be a competitor. You need to understand how all of these people that you compete with behave in the market. The key, and I'll get to this in a moment is understanding your own humans. Because they'll tell you, well, I looked at you, I looked at them, here's what I was considering. You're not going to reach that information on your own. Now, if you're a monetary crypto, you don't just have other cryptos that you might compete with, other currencies people might want to hold or might want to use. You now have the government because of fiat, the 800-pound gorilla. And fiat is modeled extensively by economists at every level of government at the federal level, down to the municipal level, within legislative branches, within executive branches, they're all looking at the money supply to try to understand what's going on. So if you compete with them and you're not doing the same kind of modeling for your token, good luck. Now, another great lesson, both of economics and of data science, is that guiding by averages alone is a very, very bad idea. You need to understand averages. That's step one. But you need to go to step 10. And the next few steps mean moving beyond the average to look at measures of shape, distributional shape. Is there bimodality? 
isn't normally distributed? Is it skewed significantly one way? Other measures of center beyond the average. What about the median? What about the mode? And details about the spread of the distribution. You should be looking at that kind of information where it's available with your data. And you should track it not just in this period, but over time. And if you do that, then with your data, specifically data related to your humans, you will be able to create what are in economics called agents. In marketing and UX, they're usually called personas. And this image is an example of the Imperitas template. If you email me, I will happily send this to you. Luciano at Imperitas.com. It's an interactive PDF. You just fill it all in with your information. You should move beyond the average, understanding who your token holders are, who your validators are, who your ambassadors and advisors are. And you should put them all into five groups. And these subgroups will be represented by some archetypal agent. That's what this sheet does. You put a picture, you put a description, you put a face on it, you explain likes and dislikes, everything you'd want to know about this individual and how they interact with you, including around value. How many tokens do they hold? Are they high token holders? Because the Pareto group, the 20% that are probably holding 80% of the value in the tokens, should definitely be one of these personas or agents that you develop. These add incredible precision to simulation. Now, for the utility tokens in particular, who have to run a business in addition to being a cryptocurrency built on blockchain, you're going to have costs. You're going to have marketing spend. You're going to have development costs. You're going to have technology. You're going to have cost of operation, customer feedback information. All of it is going to cost you money. How do you control that as a company? Cost analysis is key within economics. Fixed costs, variable costs, marginal costs, average costs, everything about it needs to be looked at. And that's because this is one of the things that is directly within your control. You don't control the demand side. You can't control holders of your token. They either have to see the value or not. But you do control your costs. And the more data you collect around these costs, the more you will be able to refine that control. You don't want to spend money on stuff that doesn't result in anything. Just like you don't want to cut something that might be expensive but is working. In order to see the difference, you have to understand your costs. Another place where crypto economics will move beyond traditional token economics is related to supply and demand. Calculating the actual functions, supply and demand, based on cost data and production data for supply, based on preference and price sensitivity data for demand. These are things you can actually estimate in the world. So you can understand an equilibrium that you might be trending towards when it comes to things like price and quantity. Looking at just what has happened in the blockchain, looking at what people predict, those are macro backward looking values. Well, you, there's data that you produce and there's data available that can help you actually look at it proactively and know where you're going instead of just where you've been. And economists call this phenomenon general equilibrium. There is a gravitation towards these outcomes. Adam Smith described it as the invisible hand in his book, Wealth of Nations. And it is true, there's no central planner that says this is what the $20 trillion U.S. economy is going to do tomorrow, and then, and then the day after, and three days after that. It doesn't exist. Instead, everything just happens. Why? There is this trend towards better outcomes, better conclusions. And if you're collecting the right data, you can start to forecast in the macro what these are, where they're going, and what you should expect. Now, as far as why you might want to do this as a crypto, this limits speculation and velocity attacks. You can't do that if there's really good data that has been proven true in the past that says things are running smooth, we should be fine. And then all of a sudden there's a fluctuation in price and people start trading, velocity goes up. That's not real value add, that's speculation. You can limit that with really predictive general equilibrium outcomes. Now, if you've gone through the process of really understanding both your own data and your competitors' data, then you can reach the next level in economic analysis within crypto economics, which is game theory. 
You put all this information into a system that will tell you best responses before things even happen. Now those things could be a shock, a regulatory shock, a preference shock. All of a sudden things change. That's a shock. That's different than maybe market changes that are gradual over time. You just see that adoption is slowing. Understanding your best response to any of these outcomes before they happen, again, gives you stability in your predictions, which means your value should be clear, which means speculative attacks and velocity attacks shouldn't be able to happen. But game theory, as amazing as it is, isn't the frontier. There's actually one step even beyond game theory, which is just broad simulation. Game theory might be something you program into it, but this is basically a digital world. It's the matrix for cryptos. Everything, all your holders and the different types of holders and the regulatory market and your environment all have equations that explain them. And there are rules about how the equations will interact and how the, they'll interact over time. And that information is put into a computer that runs just millions and millions of iterations. So you can see convergence to an equilibrium. You can see the upper bound limits, lower bound limits of things like price, like supply, like what you should do given a shock. Simulation is incredibly powerful. Well, you better have really good models. So you better have really thought through everything. You, your competitors, your market, your different types of humans, the personas or the agents within those humans, the things that motivate them, their price sensitivity. You better understand your cost, your supply, your production, your marketing. When I say production, we're talking about things like your marketing, your IT plan. Are you going to get hacked? That's in your production. You better understand all of that really in good detail with real world data. This is where the product market fit data comes in. You can estimate the parameters of these models with really good data and just watch the whole system run under assumptions of randomness or shocks. This is it. This is what you should be guiding by because it will help you with your crypto avoid the speculation, avoid the attacks, to know the real value of what you're providing so that people can consent to participate. And any information you produce, whether it's product market fit, up to simulation, I encourage you to think about making that publicly known. The more that you provide good information about what is going on, the better. Crypto economics' real distinction from tokenomics is that it is a unified theory. This isn't just using monetary or financial analysis. This is using everything in micro theory, macro theory, game theory, simulation to get the complete picture. And that complete picture, the way to really understand the importance of crypto economics is to think of each token as its own mini crypto economy. There has to be a unified picture of everything because it's all connected and one thing changing can lead to five other things changing. And if you can be proactive because you see it happening in the data, you create stability. This makes crypto better than fiat. And this is why crypto will revolutionize the world. And this unified theory is key to the second generation of cryptos that I think are beginning to emerge. So let's wrap up everything that we've covered in this crash course. Part one was a broad intro to crypto, its technology, its social impact. Part two talked about the different components of a token and the emergence of tokenomics. And then part three moved beyond tokenomics into crypto economics and explained the different methods from econ that can be used to better guide these little crypto economies. How do you keep learning from here? I recommend you read the article I wrote on LinkedIn about why crypto will kill cash. I also recommend that you listen to the podcast I was recently featured on about why crypto is changing the world. Get a hold of me if you want to continue talking crypto. If you want a version of these slides, for example, just send me an email. You can get a hold of me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or on Telegram. Thank you, everybody, for joining us in this crypto crash course. If you have feedback, 
please also send that to us. You don't have to just ask questions. We'd love to know what you thought about this course so we can continue to improve it for future people.